Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for that excellent political introduction, Claude. Well, for this seminar, we've been preparing for a few months now. Uh, thanks to the gentleman here on my left, he is going to help us uh, go through a few slides. He's an engineer, and you may well have his report in front of you. It's in French, but that report is going to be available in hard copy and in digital copy in about a month's time. We've produced a, a short summary in English, and I think you have, if I'm not mistaken, the slides in English. Yes, okay. So... I'd like to thank our interpreters in the three booths at the back, says the chairman kindly. They're helping us participate in the various different languages. So, without any further ado, let's move on to the presentation of this report. This is really the basis for our thoughts on this matter, the scientific basis, and we're going to have a few thoughts on peak oil on this basis. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon, everybody, members of the European Parliament. This is rather a paradoxical context for the seminar, as Eve has made reference to. We're currently at a stage where the publications and the reports are coming out and we're being told that there's no problem with oil, that for the next 10 years or so we're, we're going to be fine, nothing's going to change. However, Leonardo Mollery uh, was, uh, published a study while I was putting this together, saying that we're currently seeing an unprecedented era of growth in oil reserves, and particularly with the uh, accessibility of reserves in Iraq, things are uh, actually extremely positive looking towards the future. So we're meeting today to talk about peak oil and the consequences it could have for Europe. We seem to have here a microcosm of lucidity among the people here uh, in the context of the madness around us. So thank you very much for being here to discuss these matters. Um, when we set together the preparatory work for this uh, presentation, I was helped a great deal by the people sitting next to me. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Union faces a challenge which I can only describe as historical in nature. The European Union has practically no oil left today. And as such, it remains the second largest consumer at global level and the largest importer of oil at global level. Some 90% or 97% of its oil will soon be imported entirely into the European Union, which means that our oil bill is getting increasingly large. You can see here the curve of production on the slide, and there's uh, quite a clear distinction between production of oil uh, since the uh, peak oil achieved in the 90s in the United Kingdom. Uh, if you look at the... Um, amount of uh, proven oil resources are around the world we uh, correspond to about 0.4 percent uh, in europe so despite being one of the largest consumers we're one of the smallest uh, oil producing countries what that means is uh, several questions arise as to what kind of model uh, the european union should be uh, adopting with regard to oil consumption if you see here on this slide you can see the distribution of imports across the countries of the european union uh, a large third of that graph comes from Russia. We have become a, an indispensable source of income for Russia and we they've become an indispensable source of oil for us. Uh, we've also uh, Norway there that's gone past its peak oil, Africa, the Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan and so on are also in that graph. I've uh, focused on the main economies of the European Union uh, but there's not the same level of dependency in all different countries. Uh, Germany major, mainly de imports from Russia. You have Spain that uh, imports mainly from Africa and from the Middle East. France has a more or less balanced distribution from the African states. Uh, 
Uh, Italy is mainly from the Middle East and the UK depends almost entirely from Norway uh, because they're connected by a direct pipeline. So the hydrocarbons they import come mainly through that uh, pipeline. So this is the origins of the uh, imports that we receive in Europe. That brings us to the obvious question of uh, where does the future of production lie in all, each of these areas around the world? Each of these regions are facing uh, considerable difficulties at the moment. So this study was put together to try to uh, give you an overview. We talked today about reserves, about production, and how do we bring all of this together with the economy? Well, the goal of this study was to firstly talk about the reserves, the figures, the declarations that are made on these reserves, then talk about the production of petrol. Uh, the question you have to ask is, uh, what rhythm do we have to produce oil in order to supply the demands that we have daily and then how to get production into the economy. There's no kind of economic growth without uh, an input of uh, oil which can help us uh, fuel the growth. And then we have to think about investments, uh, money and oil that has to be invested into the economy uh, in order to make new discoveries of oil and new uh, oil, improving up oil reserves around the world. So this is a uh, different stages of the process. I tried to create an overview uh, of that in the study and I have some 10 minutes now to explain that to you. You can imagine that's rather difficult given the length of the study. So obviously I won't be able to go through all of the details of the study but they are in the hard copy you have. They're also on the website if you want to find the details. So very briefly on reserves, uh, world oil reserves. One thing we're certain of is that the figures are not correct. The question is by what but to what extent are they incorrect? Of course, the figures come out in a strategic sense, a political sense. The figures that have been uh, extracted uh, from the literature uh, allow a rather large uh, margin of error. The one billion uh, barrels of oil equivalent is rather a, um, a difficult figure to check. In any case, the uh, figure relates to proven plus probable reserves. So it's some, uh, f the, the, the probable reserves are uh, more than 50% of actually, uh, likelihood of actually coming to be proven uh, in the future. So it relates to gross uh, petrol or crude petrol and then refined petrol is dealt with in a different w way. You also have heavy oil and extra heavy oil from places like Venezuela. So that's uh, 500 billion euros, uh, barrels of oil equivalent in total. So all of the details that you have regarding the credibility of the figures, all the questions that crop up with these figures, they're all explained in the report. So now we get the question of production. As I was saying earlier, it's not just enough to discuss the question of oil under the ground. You also have to look at how it's going to be produced and brought to the market. What we've seen over the course of history and right up until 2008 is that we had a major economic crisis in 2008 and hand in, what went hand in hand with that was the uh, uh, economic crisis. Uh, following 2008, the oil price, however, has remained rather stable. There's been no kind of drop in uh, supply. Uh, unlike former times where you had a massive drop in supply and that caused the increase in price. What we saw between 2004 and 2008 was a price that went from $40 a barrel to $140 a barrel, but production remained actually level. What that shows is that despite the fact that the prices increased considerably, uh, producers were not able to respond to that uh, increase in demand. Uh, China, in particular, uh, increased its uh, petrol production uh, a lot over the last few decades, but was not able to respond sufficiently to the shock. And so for the first time, we had a situation where supply was not able to meet the demand which was on the rise sharply. We currently have some... 86 million barrels of oil equivalent a day. That's some 30 billion barrels of oil a year. That's the production capacity we have at the current stage. The question is, tomorrow, what's going to happen uh, with that production? Will it be able to follow and accompany the development of demand? Well, there are lots of studies that we 
uh, carry out to try to uh, judge that. Reserves over production. We, that's what they're called, these studies. Uh, if we have three, 30 billion barrels of oil a year, that's the demand, uh, rather that's the supply, we have to work out whether or not we're going to be able to satisfy demand in the future. And that curve, the graph that you can see here, demonstrates that. Uh, from the 1st of January, you can see the evolution in price and the evolution in production uh, in accordance with that. So what we do is from the 1st of January, you look at the evolution, the probable evolution into the future of production and consumption. You see that basically we are condemned to a constant increase in consumption and uh, production will decline well before the 47 years. That's the uh, cutoff point on this graph uh, of the peak production point. Production will fall off and consumption will continue to increase. So from that basis, we have a whole series of scenarios that we can put together. Various different bodies have done that. The uh, Energy Agency in the United States, the Canadian Producers Association, various different international bodies have looked at different scenarios for the future. And normally you get a very wide uh, branching off of different scenarios. Uh, some, some say that we'll have 10 million barrels of oil produced less than we have today per year in 35 years time or so, so. and some people say a lot more so there's uh, still a, an outside possibility that in 35 or 40 years time we'll still have an increase in production uh, but most scenarios actually expect a, a decrease in production these are various different scenarios but this is the central scenario drawing a, a middle ground for all of those this middle ground shows global production despite anything you might think despite all of this uh, increase in production in the united states increases in oil fines recently we're seeing that from 2014 2015 production will start to wane and despite all of these new discoveries and new proven resources. So why? Well, mainly because the most significant um, uh, producers at the moment are starting to uh, decline. The major fields are starting to run out. The question is how do we compensate for those fields that are running out uh, with other fields? Uh, this is something that we're seeing in Belgium, in the UK and so on. These fields that have existed for a long time are starting to uh, run out. The green section you can see on the graph relates to new discoveries of oil fields. Uh, this is not enough, as you can see, to compensate for the decline in existing fields and that's what we face in the future. So for future production, we need to have new discoveries, and we know that since the 60s, new discoveries are on the decline. We need uh, new oil fields being proven up. In Iraq, for example, we've got fields that have been known about for a long time that need to be proven. Uh, we also know, know there are non-conventional forms such as shale oil and so on. Uh, synthetic uh, fuels as well, such as... Uh, um, coal and synthetic coal forms and things like that to try to offset the loss. So based on what we have today in terms of available technologies, it's going to be very difficult to compensate for the declining uh, production. The major constraint used to be the price in harnessing demand, but now what we're seeing is uh, a change in that. We need increased investment. Uh, for example, you need uh, large investments in offshore oil rigs to be able to drill deep enough to actually get to the reserves now. So that's one of the major constraints today. Where do we get that money from? Also, there are extreme operating conditions for the reasons I've tried to explain. There are environmental constraints currently on production. Uh, it's becoming more and more risky now. We have geopolitical constraints uh, with tensions around the world that are considerable. So enormous amounts of considerable factors are now adding uh, the constraints uh, to oil production. And it's been described in some reports recently as a formidable set of circumstances for those wanting to produce oil. Uh, if you look at the energy return rate, so how much do you have to input in order to get a return on your energy investment? Well, energy return on energy invested, EROI as it's known, um, is something that's being studied. Uh, 
this is something that we know over the 20, uh, 20th century if you uh, input 20 barrels you got 100 back we know that if you put in now 10 uh, bar barrels of energy you get uh, 10 back in uh, american oil you get five back in uh, heavy oil or you get a similar amount from uh, maize if you put in uh, energy through um, maize oil you basically won't get any kind of energy return back you'll get a balance of zero so with the uh, increasingly costly energies in terms of the energy they require you get a drop in net energy available for society and the rate actually drops down to close to zero because uh, society is in consuming more energy and the techniques required uh, is actually um, increasing the minimum global eroi required for industrial society to operate so all of the expenditure that is required for infrastructures the roads and so on everything that's expended requires energy so you need some eight to ten uh, and uh, at the moment that's seven to sixteen so you can see there's a considerable decline expected so now let's look at Europe's vulnerability to these changes. The fact that supply is dropping below demand. Well, the various questions that come up are, for example, which sectors are not vulnerable? That's one of the points I tried to address in the report. Uh, at the moment, we all depend slightly on petrol. I could ask you all here today, who doesn't depend on petrol, on oil? Uh, most of the transport that we use depends on petrol. So practically everyone's dependent on oil in some form or another. So we're all vulnerable. All societies and sectors of society are vulnerable. Which are more vulnerable, which are less vulnerable? Well, our priorities at the moment, uh, we have to decide which political priorities we have in terms of making society work properly. And those f essential s sectors need to be made priority. In this study, I've tried to assess why those sectors are particularly vulnerable, where the vulnerability lies, and why the absence of petrol will be difficult in particular for those sectors. And I've tried to answer most of these questions. For example, transport. If we look at growth factors for Europe, I think we depend on transport. We're rather specialised in uh, Europe. We make airbuses, we make uh, trucks, we make cars. The automobile and uh, air, um, airline industries uh, employ 17 million people across Europe, a significant percentage of the population of Europe. This is for cars and planes, cars which depend on uh, hydrocarbons. 60% of uh, goods in Europe are transported by road. Uh, most uh, personnel getting to work actually travel by car or by public transport which depends on petrol so how is this all going to happen in a continent which doesn't have enough oil and in a, a context where 96% uh, of oil is imported and imports are going to get more difficult in the future well we're expecting some 30 to 40 percent drop in demand for uh, cars which depend on petrol uh, airline companies are going to stop renewing their planes there's going to be uh, a number of bankruptcies and things of that nature so we can expect a certain ch amount of changes for the sector as a result of uh, increasing prices i'll have to conclude i think because i think i'm running towards the end of my time ah excellent i've got a few more minutes extraordinary so just to be as concise as I can, you can consult the study at your leisure afterwards if you want more precise information, but the most striking thing is that it's very unlikely for production of oil to continue to increase. However, uh, there is a, d a strong probability that production will start to decline. So why are we basing or rather, should we base our policy making on uh, the small probability that oil will continue to increase in production, or should we base it on the probability that it will decline? So this comes to public policy making.
personally speaking, I think the consequences of denial and pass passiveness in the face of the obvious will be much more costly from all perspectives than an, a preemptive, proactive stance to what is clearly going to happen. I think citizens' mobility is really fundamental. I think in socio-economic terms, we are clearly in a period of crisis or perhaps better described as a period of mutation. We're changing society due to this period of crisis. So this change requires mobilization for citizens around this uh, project, namely to build society around citizens. Uh, we can't depend on oil which won't exist in the future. So we need something that will mobilize us, uh, collective actions, and of course that means mobilizing companies, our energies, our materials, moving everything towards uh, diversification within the sector, innovation, and converting our activities from one form to another. We shouldn't try to maintain at any cost things that we know are going to disappear. So this transition from oil to other forms of energy is not a choice. It's inevitable. We have to prepare for the change. I think we are at the right juncture now to make that choice. Thank <laughs> you.